Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 50, Driver Suit Blog Radio. As always, I'm your host, David G. Firestone. I said last week we were going to do an awesome racing movie for this week. I'm pushing that back to next week since something I was working on sort of fell through at the last minute, which sucks, but it does happen. But I found something good to replace it, so we're going to go through with that. Now, in 1990, a NASCAR movie was released that took the world by storm. It used real-life racing footage, had great prop cars, and a well-known and well-respected actor in the lead. And that movie was called Dorf Goes Auto Racing. Now, don't worry if you've never heard of it, and most people haven't. Written by and starring comedian Tim Conway, actor and comedian, the Dorf series featured Conway as a character named Dusseldorf, now, Dusseldorf was a rehash of the character Mr. Tudball in the Miss Wiggins skits from The Carol Burnett Show. Mr. Tudball wants to run an office and wants to run it as smoothly as possible. Miss Wiggins is his secretary and constantly screws up. Now, this series of skits was successful because of the chemistry that Burnett and Conway had. For the Dorf movies, Conway took Mr. Tudball, added a hairpiece, and decided the best way to rejuvenate the character was make him shorter... So in most of the scenes he's in, he's standing in a hole with his shoes on his knees. This is sort of the uh, place, this is sort of the uh, where a lot of the humor comes from in this show. Now the movie itself starts out with uh, Dorf racing and winning the Formula One championship using questionable methods. Now when asked about winning his championship, he says that he has won the Romanian 50, the Bulgarian 20, the Lichtenstein 10, and the Minx 2. The Minxed 2? When the reporter says that, quote, the Yanks say that until you've won the stock car, you ain't won yet. I've never heard an American say that, but that's just me. When Dorf asks who said that, the reporter states Dale Earnhardt, Card Petty, Richard Petty, Mark Martin, so Dorf makes the decision to, to race in NASCAR. He gets signed by Colonel Ovid Bolas, a cheap owner who flies Dorf from Europe to California on a biplane. He meets Bolas' assistant, Dipstick Taylor, a talkative nerd who is slow to understand things. And they arrive at a a hotel where they have a press conference attended by three people. The scene then cuts to Sonoma Raceway, then then known as Sears Point Raceway. Dorf introduces his pit crew... Tony Chiboki, who spends his entire movie eating a sandwich, Timber Jim, who is seven feet tall, Willie Davis, who incessantly plays a flute he carved by hand, and Boom Boom, a hot bikini-clad woman who literally contributes nothing to the pit to the proceedings and is ignored by the crew. And finally there's Pops there's Pops Morgan, who is an old slow man. Now this Pops is one of Pops' big sequences is a sequence where he gets struck he gets stuck on the track where the cars where the cars fly by. I can't talk tonight. It's our it's a funny it's a funny skit, but it's sort of the highlight of the humor in this. Now Dorf ne- is next asked about his car and a v- vintage NASCAR Monte Carlo with steam pouring out of the engine is moved across the street behind him. The announcer sarcastically remarks the pieces are in place. Top driver, cream of the crop pit crew, a lousy car, and a greedy owner. These are then followed by interviews with Harry Gant, Ken Schrader, Jeff Bodine, and Michael Waltrip. Waltrip is angrily working on his wrecked number 30 country time Pontiac, all the time cursing and blaming Dorf. Now as the announcer is talking, he is given a piece of paper announces with 30 left with 30 minutes left to go before the race. For some inexplicable reason, Budweiser and Junior Johnson will be supplying Dorf with a car. Uh, The next scene is a series of qualifying events, including Rusty Wallace, Harry Gant, and Sterling Marlin. Dorf being forced to qualify for his NASCAR license, and the Budweiser hauler driving to the track. Somehow or other, Dorf gets his license, and the car is given over to his incompetent pit crew. Dorf surprisingly qualifies well. Another series of interviews follows, including Richard Petty, Rusty Wallace, and Daryl Waltrip, all of whom blast his abilities as a driver. Uh, the scene shifts to a hotel where Sears Point is having a banquet, and Dorf is a guest of honor. The keynote 
speaker discusses the choosing of the spark plug and actually ma somehow makes it even more boring than it is in real life. It's actually kind of amazing how they did that. So the next day, the race is held, and the vice president of NASCAR states that because of dwarf, they're going to be reviewing their licensing their licensing process. Uh, Unical's 76's representative, who at the time was NASCAR's fuel sponsor, states that he ran Dorf out of the office, but reluctantly admits he has to provide fuel to Dorf's team. Even the gentleman Ned Jarrett takes a shot at Dorf. Hoyt Axton makes a cameo singing the National Anthem, Willie plays along, and Dorf struggles to remove his helmet. Now, you'd think for a guy with a statue like Dorf's, you would be easy to get him into the car. Nope. It's a, the whole thing is a struggle, and the crew fights over the steering wheel. Dorf fires the engine, but it sounds terrible. The steering wheel comes off. Dick, dipstick radios Dorf, stating, Dorf, come on in. Dorf pulls into the pit lane, only to be told, I wanted to talk to you on the radio. When he returns to the pit lane a second time, Dorf finds his crew literally doing nothing. Dorf asks for water. Tony holds out a stick that's too short for Dorf to reach, and he leaves. Tell me, he leaves Tony to find a bigger stick. I'll be back. Dorf comes in a third time, and Tony spills water all over Dorf's lap. Glad that he didn't order the hot soup. Dorf drives off, which is actually a pretty funny line. A fourth pit stop occurs with Dorf complaining that he's low on fuel. The tires are low, and the glove box fell off. The classic Benny Hill Jack get Jack. The classic Benny Hill jack gag where the jack is under the car and lifts the driver as opposed to the car takes place. And all the air is let out of the tire. Dipstick climbs in the car and Dorf is forced to make yet another pit stop to let him out. Where the announcer quips that the crew is the quote keystone cops of auto racing. The car is eventually refueled using a 1950 style gas pump. Dorf then somehow drives off out of the track entirely through a fast food restaurant and is given the directions back to the track for some cops. Now, at this point, Boom Boom, who has contributed little, if anything, to the movie, starts sunbathing and slowly removes her jumpsuit. Dorf wrecks the two leaders and the rest. The other drivers are distracted by Boom Boom, now donned her bikini top, leaving Dorf the leader. The flagman was going to throw the yellow flag, but... Boom Boom, now only wearing the bikini, distracts him and he throws the checkered flag instead. As Dorf celebrates his time in victory lane, an angry mob comes after him and Dorf grabs one of the moorlings for the good way, the Goodyear blimp and flies away. The end. Now I will give this movie a piece of credit it truly deserves. For a direct to VHS release, they got cameos from some very good NASCAR talent. Harry Gant, Ken Schrader, Jeff Budine, Michael Waltrip, Richard Petty, Rusty Wallace, Daryl Waltrip, and Ned Jarrett. Um, and also something that I really like about this is that the on-track announcing for a NASCAR movie is really good. Something that movies and TV shows isn't always the case. Uh, the Ready 500, which I covered a few weeks ago, has some of the worst racing announcing I've ever seen. But in this movie, the late Bruce Flanders did a great job, and Flanders was a real announcer, and he made it work. Sadly, Flanders' announcing is really one of the only things that did work. Much of the racing footage was shot during the 1989 Banquet Foods 300, and it looks good, but aside from those two things, the movie is a flop. As much as I loved Tim Conway and I liked his work as Dorf, the movie falls flat. Tim Conway must not have understood that much about NASCAR because most of the movie relies on willful suspension of disbelief, which at some points is almost impossible. The chemistry he had with Carol Willett is not present with any of the other actors, and while the cameos actually work well, because the actors are clearly annoyed with the whole premise, and, are, and a couple of them are clearly doing it for some extra cash. Uh, the humor doesn't work on several levels. You have to be a NASCAR fan to get most of the jokes, so it doesn't work for non-racing fans. Many of the in-jokes don't work since they're so over-the-top, they're not good. And Dorf is a character that will never fit in NASCAR, and just besides that, the premise is bad and it borders on obscurity. It didn't work then, and it doesn't work now. So, we're going to talk about a forgotten racing movie gem 
that for some reason doesn't get near the respect that it deserves. It doesn't get near the attention it deserves by NASCAR and their NASCAR and drivers and fans. I don't know how it worked out this way, but I'll see you next week with episode 51 of Driver's Suit Blog Radio. I'm Dave Farsley. Have a like, comment, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you next week.